Divinity School. Our uh, president is sad, but he's not with you tonight to greet you all and to be in our community. He will be with us tomorrow. But Dr. McNichol um, is at an event in Buffalo. They had a snow out, and so they said, we got it. I know, I, I know that shocks you. This is mine, right? Um, but uh, he, just, he just was juggling too many things, and um, so in his stead, I am with you this evening. Uh, the Steely Stuber Lecture is a part of our regular series here at CRCDS. The lecture was inaugurated in 1984 by the children of Dr. Stanley L. Stuber in honor of his 80th birthday. Dr. Stuber is an, is an alumnus of Rochester Theological School, class of 1928, and he became a leader in the Baptist tradition. He was a pastor, a writer, an editor. He was a noted ecumenist. And through this lecture, we honor uh, his legacy and his wisdom and the gift that he was to the church and to the world. And so we look at ecumenical and world issues in this lecture, and hence the topic for this evening. We are delighted to have um, the children and spouses of, of Dr. Stuber with us and uh, one of his granddaughters. Uh, uh, so the folks who know that you're here with us, it's always a joy to have the Stuber family with us in the spring at CRCDS. As a part of preparing for this lectureship, um, we established the CRCDS Green Team. And the green team, um, which was made up of a member of our student body, one of our staff members, and one of our faculty, began to look at um, what we we're doing here at CRCDS um, with regards to, are we very green? What should we be doing to become more green? And um, so they've come up with some suggestions. I mean, we have our blue bins around, but you know, we have some other issues. Are we, you know, are we copying things to do plus? Are we doing all those things? So they, they suggested that we create a compost bin here at CRCDS, that we expand our recycling program, that we develop an all-campus organic vegetable garden, that we consider treatment of the ground, i.e. the fertilizer, and look at those options, <coughs> um, that we look at renewable energy and get a grant uh, to do an audit and look at possibly implementing some other new approaches to our energy use here on the Hill. They've also suggested that we do some workshops through the academic year so that we could learn um, as a community how to be more green. And so these initiatives are before our leadership for their consideration and um, we'll be reporting back to let you know how we're doing with being a green campus because it certainly is one of our goals here at CRCDS. <coughs> Again, I want to welcome you this evening, and I'd like to turn the microphone over to one of our students, Cheryl Frank, who's going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Good evening, and welcome to the Stanley Stuber Spring Lecture Week 2015. I'd like to introduce, it's my honor to introduce our speaker today, Elia Delio. She's a Franciscan sister, of Washington, D.C., and she's the Director of Catholic <coughs> Studies at Georgetown University. She serves there as a visiting professor at Georgetown University, and she holds a doctorate in pharmacology from Rutgers University in New Jersey Medical School. She has a doctorate in historical theology from Fordham <coughs> University. She has written 14 books, including Care for Creation, which won two Catholic Press Book Awards in 2009. Her new books are The Unbearable Wholeness of Being, God, Evolution, and the Power of Love. And another one of her new books is From Teilhard to Omega, Co-Creating an Unfinished Universe. So, welcome. <coughs> Thank you for inviting 
inviting me. I have heard of Colgate Divinity School for many years, and so I finally have an opportunity to visit this lovely place. Uh, it's a beautiful area. I always think of Rochester as cold snow. So, <laughs> you know, you know, I, I'm delighted to see no snow. in our day and age, but I'd like to place ecology within a wider framework, and I think that's really uh, essential to going forward. So I tell a broader story than, in a sense, um, not so specific on what to do, but maybe a wider story on why we need to do what we're doing. <clears throat> a lot of my work is based on the uh, vision of the French Jesuit scientist Pierre Teilhard de Jouillet. Uh, Teilhard lived uh, in the 20th century. He was born actually in 1881 and died in 1955. So he lived through two world wars. He was a scientist, a paleontologist, and uh, <clears throat> spent his life, devoted his life, to study human origins. But he was a Jesuit. And therefore, not <laughs> <laughs> but he was deeply committed to the gospel, and, and actually his, his great devotion was to the Sacred Heart. And so he spent his lifetime trying to bring together not just science and religion, but Christianity and evolution. And at one point in his writings, he said, the artificial separation between humans and cosmos is at the root of our contemporary moral confusion. Now, I don't think we wake up in the morning and ask, gee, what's my cosmology today? <laughs> but every one of us has an operative cosmology. In other words, especially if we talk about the things of religion, if we, use, if we say the name God, we have a certain, in a sense, spatial temporal understanding of God. We use the language of heaven or earth. And uh, what Teilhard is basically saying is that uh, religious people have an old cosmology, even though we live in a new world. Uh, Raymond Panikar, one of the great mystics of the 20th century, said, the very name of God is a cosmological notion. Now, again, by cosmos, we mean the whole physical order of things. So when God reveals God's self in Exodus as I am, as the being of being itself, um, he's, you know, the revelation is, in a sense, I am cosmos. I am being. So Panikar says there is no cosmos without God and no God without cosmos. We couldn't even utter the name God without a whole. <coughs> now, <clears throat> now, having said that, I think it's helpful. One of the things I always say is, it's good to know where we're coming from to know where we might be going to. So I just want to take a very quick, pick, a quick peek. <laughs> that was the wine this evening. <laughs> At the cosmology that has shaped our religious thinking, no matter you know, what the spectrum, Christian thinking, up until the recent times. Our Christian story really comes out of the Middle Ages, like it or not. I mean, our cosmology is medieval. This is uh, a, a basic schema of the Greek cosmos as described by the astronomer Ptolemy. And uh, you'll notice that, that cos the cosmos is perfectly ordered, very nicely concentric circles, uh, immutable, um, unchanging, hierarchical, graded levels of being. But what's significant about this cosmos is it's geocentric. The Earth is in the center of this stable, fixed cosmos. And in the center of the Earth is the human person, right? Because we were created on the sixth day in the image of God before God rested. So in this stable fixed
fixed cosmos, it was necessary, in a sense, to find reason for the destruction and the sinfulness of, so to speak, of human behavior. So we know the story. There was perfect order, an original garden, and then there was disorder due to a disobedience. And we know that the cause of that disobedience was an apple tempted by a woman, right? So, order, sin, redemption. That kind of basic framework has been with us since forever, really. The one thing good about the medievalists is that they had a real consonance between nature and scripture, right? The one word of God spoken in nature is the word of God spoken in scripture. So they saw a, saw a, a consonance or a complement between these two books, which the whole was the book of Christ. So you have like a Francis of Assisi or someone going around finding the footprints of God in the things of nature. Uh, Meister Eckhart, the Dominican, said, anyone who truly knows creatures may be excused from listening to sermons, for every creature is full of God and is a book. So I always say, you know, build your churches or your communities with large windows, because depending on who's preaching that day, you can still hear a sermon. That's right. <laughs> Um, we know from these times as well that architecture also shaped religious thinking. Uh, this is a little snapshot of the Washington Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Beautiful Episcopalian Cathedral. You walk in and you're drawn up by the hundred foot ceilings. Gothic architecture was Neoplatonic spirituality. God is above, God's light shines from above, into the below and lifts us up to the divine. So you walk into the church, you're lifted up high, and you go, wow, that's incredible. And what scholars have pointed out is that this kind of lifting up consciousness uh, has gave rise over time to turning away from the earth. Our consciousness, our awareness, was up above, toward heaven, towards the, you know, towards this magnificent light. So, you know, the old maxim that the law of prayer was the law of belief, was the law of life. As we became wired over and over to turn away from earth towards these things of heaven, we became neglectful of the earth. This, in a sense, became ontologized, you might say, with the idea that there were graded levels of being. God being perfect being, the human being below God, below the angels, but greater than beasts. So we have this idea that plants and beasts and stones were of lesser being, lesser value than humans, and humans ascending or aspiring to that perfect, you know, the language of perfection or spiritual perfection began to creep in here. You know, and people thought, you know, I need to be spiritually perfect, you know, to be like God. And, that meant everything from how you look to how you talk to what you did that day. Um, it became a very inward focused, very self-focused type of spirituality in which the world at large was largely ignored. I mean, creation was just like a background for human endeavors. Even the way we began to interpret Genesis, you know, that um, we humans, you know, made the image of God set apart from Earth means that it's really all about us, you know. It's really, we were the center of God's eye, you know. It's really about us being the special objects of God's grace, and as if the natural world was just a stage for human redemption. A very anthropocentric. All of this really became challenged with the rise of modern science. In the late 14th century, uh, early 15th century, we had astronomers like Nicholas Copernicus and others who began to realize that the Earth was not a stable, fixed center. That when they looked through their telescopes and observed the heavens, the Earth seemed to be moving with the other planets. Well, that was an enormous 
upset for things, for the religious minded. Uh, from, uh, at least from the, the Catholic side, you know, they got really, really <coughs> upstarted about this. And they said, well, how would we explain sin? How could we possibly explain, you know, the human person as image of God? Uh, Tycho Brahe, you know, uh, Kepler said, oh, Dick is right, you know, we're moving. We are moving with the other planets. And the sun is center of this cosmos. Well, uh, we know that it always takes a good Italian to really <laughs> <laughs> That's really true, you know. Uh, Galileo Galilei, with a very more powerful telescope, said, no, oh, oh, the old system was good, but this one's better. Copernicus's system, heliocentrism, is more appropriately descriptive of the cosmos we actually live in. Well, I always say, if Galileo had email or Twitter, he probably would have had more out of him, but, you know, he was placed under house arrest forever until 1984. <laughs> 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 so, well, but even one of the cardinals there said, well, you know, the Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. The Bible is not a science book, right? It's not meant to tell us about the things of science. But I see this, this point, it really marks the rift between science and religion. Religion was neatly packaged around the old Greek cosmos. Why should we change the story? So uh, we know that modern philosophy followed suit. Rene Descartes, a Jesuit trained mathematician, I, 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 th I always think of Descartes as someone a little bit slightly neurotic or neurologic, you know, like, how could I know anything for certain? I mean, if the earth is moving, how could I know God for certain? You know, before I thought I could know him in nature. Now nature seems to be moving. So Descartes said, I know. I think, therefore I am, right? And if I exist, there must be perfect being, God. <laughs> so what Descartes does is he strips the world of sacred meaning. He strips the natural world of any divine meaning, and he places certainty of divine in the self-thinking subject. So after Descartes, we have then a world of brute matter. Do with it what you want. It, it has no meaning whatsoever. You can chop it up, you know, slice it up, slice, dice it. It's, it's just a world of stuff. And that's the world that Newton actually began to build his principles of motion and his laws of gravity upon. Newton's world was the law of stuff. The law of the sacred was separate and distinct from that stuff. God was the deus, the, the, the clockmaker god, you know, or I always call Newton's god the Florida god. You know, <laughs> sort of like the god who set it all in motion, you know, the one big machine, we set it all up, and then God sort of retires to Florida, <laughs> goes, hangs out in, in Orlando, and then checks in once in a while with the kids, you know, how's it going down there, tunes things up. So Newton's world was the world of law and order, where everything functioned in its own autonomous place. You are you, and I am I. Now, if we want to be friends, you know, we have certain fundamental laws that, you know, govern our existence, but, you know, I don't feel any connection to you, and you're not connected to me, unless I make that choice to be so. And, you know, we began to build our world according to Newton's principles. I know that um, even, even among the churches, I think this little maxim that's right out of um, religious life, you know, uh, holds true. Keep the rule, and the rule will keep you. In other words, you just follow the rule, and you will be okay. God will bless you, you'll go to heaven, you know, and the whole works. But I think, I think on a very practical level, of going to church on Sunday. Now, where I go to church, everyone sits in the same pew <laughs> every Sunday, right? So you go in one Sunday, and you're a little bit late. You know, you're running late, and you go, Oh my God, she's sitting in my pew. <laughs> you're all of a sudden, you know, you forget why you went there. You think to yourself, well, should I tell her to move? I mean, this 
to it, he's going to sit. So you know, your whole religious mindset is thrown off. We're like this. We are little Newtonians, all of us. We're coming out of Newton's world. You know, I always sit in the seat. You know, you're sitting in my seat. Well, I didn't see a sign that said you're a seat. You know, that's what we're saying. And you know, even if you look at our, our neighborhoods, you know, we have houses, you know, separate houses. We have separate cars. We have everything is in little block work. It's a little block work universe. So Barbara Taylor Brown said, you know, this is how our churches became, like Newton's universe. She said, walk into many churches, and you'll hear God described as a being who beha behaves almost as predictably as Newton's universe. Say you believe in God, you'll be saved. Sin against God, you'll be condemned. Say you're sorry, you'll be forgiven. Obey the law, you'll be blessed, right? So people say, oh, well, you know, I went to church every Sunday, I prayed, why did God allow this to happen to me? That, that's a Newtonian statement. You're saying, I followed the rule, and God should have followed the rule too. But here's the, here's the challenge for us. A religion built on stability and immutability is not prepared for a cosmic order based on change. And this is our challenge. So we have built up religion based on a fixed, static, cosmological framework. But we don't live in that cosmos. This is our cosmos. It is old, large, dynamic, and interconnected. Now, it's a very large, we cannot get our heads around the size of our cosmos that we call home. We, first of all, we exist on a sort of mid-sized galaxy, the Milky Way. We're sort of little suburbans in terms of the cosmos. <laughs> um, we have about 200 million stars or so around us, and we stretch about 100,000 light years. We can't get our heads around that, 100,000 light years. Many of the galaxies are often grouped into clusters. So we're talking about large collections of stars. Now, I think the first thing you know, we need to get our heads around is, are we it? in the cosmos, really. This is it. You know, the only form of intelligent life in the cosmos is here on little planet Earth in little suburban Milky Way. Well, I just think we need to widen our scope and entertain the possibility that maybe not. Second, it's old. You're feeling old? Think of the cosmos. <laughs> 13.8 billion years old. Now, we cannot get our heads around a billion years, never mind 13.8 billion years. It has a rather, I mean, scientists are still grappling with its beginning. Some speculate that we might emerge out of uh, uh, another uh, universe that collapsed, like into a black hole. Um, I leave that to science. All we know is that it has a hot, dead something beginning that we call a Big Bang. In other words, science can only go so far to say exactly what happened, and then mathematics breaks down. But it's something like a quantum event. You know, sort of like a quantum, it, it's sort of a blip on the screen. It's a small, hot, dense something that is so hot and dense, it explodes. It sort of rapidly expands, and as it expands, it starts cooling. And as it cools, the fundamental forces of the universe are set in place within the first three minutes of this universe. That's astounding. Seriously astounding. Now, time, because we're all over the time pressures. The first star is formed about 400 million years after the Big Bang. That's relatively recent. Galaxies and planets began forming about a, a billion years after the Big Bang. Most of our universe is dark energy, about 72% of it. That's the energy of expansion. A small percentage of it is dark matter, the energy of contraction. In other words, we are expanding, but there's something that keeps holding us together so that we just don't fly off into space, nor do we collapse inward. And here's the really sobering thought of it all. 
So, you know the song that says 70 for most, 80 if you're strong, 90 with good drugs type thing? <laughs> <laughs> this universe will continue on about 9 billion years if the sun burns out between 6 and 9 billion years. And say the sun just happens to go on, it could expand indefinitely, maybe for 100 trillion years. So we're all worried about, you know, what's going to happen to us tomorrow. Well, the universe that's 13.8 billion years old plans to go on for at least that length of time, if not, you know, quadruple that. It's, it has an infinite future before it. We need to rearrange our thinking. Um, now, it's an expanding universe, and we can find ourselves expanding. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that just is a constant with the universe. Uh, it all really changed, though, with Albert Einstein. Einstein was uh, not happy with Newton's ideas of absolute space and absolute time. Most religious language, by the way, is couched in language of absolute space and absolute time. But Einstein, the great, you know, creative genius that he was, imagined what it would be like to ride a beam of light at the speed of light. I mean, do you wake up and do these things? I don't know. <laughs> um, what he eventually came up with on a sheet of paper, I think a sheet and half of paper, were all the mathematical equations that said, nope, no such thing as absolute space or absolute time. In fact, it's not even space and time. It's space time. And space-time is a dimension of this multi-dimensional universe. And we, we still cannot quite get our heads around that. What he is saying is that the universe is not like Mr. Machine or Legos, what Newton thought. The universe is more like taffy or slinky or bubblegum, you know? It stretches. It shrinks. And it stretches or shrinks depending on gravity or the mass within it. It is a finely tuned universe. I mean, a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of 1% faster, the cosmic material would have flung too far apart for anything significant to happen. We would not be here. If gravity had been 10 to the 33rd times weaker than electromagnetism, the stars would have burned up, and we still would not be here. I mean, one would have to just say, this is completely, incredibly awesome. So what we are saying is that all that makes us us, in other words, the carbon in our bloods, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the, the compounds, the elements, were already present in the Big Bang. We are literally, you know, uh, daughters and sons of stardust. So we can say we are in the universe, and the universe is in us. <laughs> what Einstein did go on to show is that it's not a world of brute matter. It is rather a world of energy. If you were to ask what is the primordial stuff of life, it is energy. And energy can be converted to matter, mass, and mass to energy. That's his famous E equals MC squared. So we humans are sort of like you know, energy showed up in bodies. Um, and basically that's what he's saying is that mass and energy are not two separate things. You know, like I'm a body who has energy. No, you are a body that is energy. Uh, but, you know, the language that we have grown up with, just in the same way that, I mean, you can transpose these to body and soul or matter and spirit. You know, so many people still ask, well, what happens to the soul when you go to heaven or something, you know? Because like, we're still dualists. Religiously, we still have this old dualism stuff in our mind, even though science is telling us, no, it's really energy, mass energy. You know, it's a continuum. Now, scientists did show us early in the 20th century that the stuff of life, the basic stuff of life that we call matter, is inherently pluralistic. Inherently. In other words, 
through these uh, famous experiments called the double slit experiment, you know, where you put two, you know, two slits in a wall and you shoot a beam of electrons. I know you do this at night or something. <laughs> you shoot a beam of electrons and you might predict in the old paradigm two beams of electrons on the other side of the wall. But what scientists found is though there was a strange particle wave interference pattern and the only way you could know something is if you measured it. And they call this wave particle duality. In other words, our universe is not this objective thing out there, you know, that's different from me. It's really a participatory universe. We name what is actually exists. We, our observation of something brings it into reality. So the line between subject and object has really dimmed, if, fa if not faded. What scientists have now come to show us is that the stuff of life are not little billiard board balls of matter bumping into each other, rather more like webs of relations. Uh, you might say that everything in the universe is genetically related, like a continuous web, you know, each thing with the rest. So that the term interconnectedness may be the most apt description of physical reality. It is an interconnected universe. Now, Einstein, early on, you know, he wasn't too keen about quantum physics. I don't know if you know much about Einstein, but he thought, you know, a little spooky and weird, and God doesn't play dice type thing. You know, there's got to be laws written in there. But two of his postdocs, you know, uh, said, well, what if we, what if we took two particles that had interacted and we split them apart? You know, and he said. What if we place half the particle here in Rochester on this desk and the other half on the moon? What would happen if we were to turn this particle 180 degrees up? And they said, well, maybe the one on the moon will turn 180 degrees down if it's really an interconnected universe. And sure enough, that, that experiment was shown to be later on by John Bell, that two particles that have interacted when separated the one will not just influence the other, but produce a change in the other in direct proportion to the change in itself. And he called this quantum entanglement. In other words, we are not separate. The stuff of life is not separate stuff. It is deeply interconnected stuff. Um, Einstein called this non-local action at a distance. But you know, we have this, we have something of this phenomenon all the time. Just recently, I was thinking of a colleague of mine, Bill Dingus, and I was thinking, gee, I wonder how Bill is doing. You know, I haven't heard from him, I should give him a call, I think I really should email him. I opened up my email this morning, who did I get an email from? Bill Dingus. Now we used to say, what a coincidence, right? Bill email, I just, now we can say we're constantly entangled. <laughs> Be careful who you engage with. You are entangled forever. Your lives will impact them. Uh, but it also means this, and what the scientists are finding more and more, even in terms of the brain, uh, Donald Hebb said, those who fire together, wire together. In other words, if fields of energy link us, then those fields can, in a sense, create a, a communion between us, no matter how far apart we are. Uh, this is a famous saying by Paul Dirac in his um, acceptance of the Nobel Prize. He says, pick a flower on Earth and you move the farthest star. You see, because we don't have a sense of the cosmos, as this unfolding, interlocking wholeness of created mass energy, we don't realize that our actions can have cosmic effects. Pick a flower and you move the farthest star. So David Bohm, colleague of Einstein, says, as human beings and societies, we seem separate. But in our roots, we are part of an indivisible whole and share in the same cosmic process. 
all of us, uh, you know, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Jains, Buddhists, atheists, from Ethiopia, Afghanistan, China, Russia, if you were to go at the fabric of the universe and turn our world inside out, you could not tell the difference. We would be one whole. Now, what scientists are realizing today is that we are moving. We used to think that <coughs> systems were closed, you know, like little boxes. Like you have your church and I have my church and you have, you know, your house and I have my house. And that kind of closed <coughs> is a self-contained thing, you know. Uh, where you, you know, I do my work, here's what I'm about, I do it, don't, don't bother me type thing. You know, closed system has little interaction with the environment. But nature, what we find in nature today, does really works more according to open systems. Now, there may be some closed loops, in other words, on, on daily functioning, but most systems are far from equilibrium. I know when I was growing up, the big thing was equilibrium, equilibrium. Now it's like, no, chaos, chaos, make sure you're far from equilibrium. An open system is open to the environment. In other words, spontaneous new things can happen. Um, you know that, we, we know even from our own experience, when things are sort of off, you know, out of kilter and it's all chaos, something new can happen. And in a closed system, you go, oh my god, what are we going to do? In an open system, you go, great, what's happening? See? <laughs> so an open system interacts with the environment and, and can um, move into a new pattern. And of course, one of the famous theories that you might say reflects open systems is chaos theory. Chaos theory was um, discovered by the meteorologist Edward Lorenz, where, you know, he was working in the 60s where they had, the, remember the big computers that took all, the whole room, you know, and uh, he had the computer going, he was mapping weather patterns. And it was taking forever one day, so he went, took a long break, and he came back and he saw this strange pattern on his computer screen. And he goes, what is that? You know, and then he realized that um, the weather patterns were moving into a new system, a new pattern of order. So the theory, chaos theory, means that, you know, every system will have a pattern, but because it's open to the environment, that system can have maybe like a small little spontaneous new pattern within it, what he called a strange attractor. The strange attractor is in the system, but different from it. And over time, that can pull the system into a new pattern of order. So we've heard this probably. You know, the little butterfly flapping its wings here in Rochester looks so innocent and cute. You know, can set off a tsunami in the Philippines. And you go, huh? You know, really? That cute little thing did that terrible damage? And we're saying, yes, because the flapping of the wings disturbed or created a new pattern of order with an existing pattern which amplified over distances, creating, you know, havoc. I look at this on the human level, though, you know, because we don't think of ourselves in terms of chaos theory, but it might be a good thing to do. <laughs> you know, um, for example, my inability to forgive someone, you know, who, you know, may have said something against me or, you know, hurt me. Uh, could I possibly be conscious that my inability to forgive creates a negative pattern, you know, a negative energy field that can amplify, you know, uh, over space-time? And could I be responsible in part for the conflict in Iraq? Could I be responsible for some of the atrocities in the Middle East? And we think to ourselves, oh, those poor people over there. But you see, in an interconnected universe, we are part and parcel of the whole. That's what we're saying here. Now, the third part of this science story is this. We are in evolution. Evolution is not a theory. It's not, you know, you can't believe in evolution. It's not a belief system. It is, rather, um, it is the best description of biological and cosmic life. That's all we're saying here. Uh, and to this day, you know, more than 40% of the U.S. population still does not accept evolution 
as the way human life has emerged. I once had a conversation with a woman who came to visit me. She was, I guess, a, more of a conservative evangelical strain, and she said, so what are you working on? I said, well, evolution in Christianity. And she said, oh, well, she said, evolution is just a theory. And I said, well, no, it's more than a theory. I said, most of our modern inventions and modern science is based on uh, principles of evolution. She said, no, no, no. She said, you know, uh, it's just a theory. She said, you know, for us, she said, God created Adam and Eve, fully formed, and placed them here on Earth less than 10,000 years ago. And I said, oh, I said, that was just a story that was told at that time. She said, no, that's, that's how God did it. And I said, no. It's nice knowing you. <laughs> Uh, you can't, you know, I, I mean, you can't, uh, you have to just, first of all, read the science. I mean, I, I, I say to many people today, before you read a religious book, please read Scientific American or read science. We are tend to still stick with this, you know, religion story as with an old cosmology. So all we're saying with evolution is this. It's not a static, fixed species that we are. We are a dynamic species. We emerge. Um, life is about change. Uh, diversity, you know, new things happen. And so uh, life, biological life, like cosmic life, is not mechanistic, really, it's process. And by process, we mean an interplay between lawfulness, certainly, you know, there's laws within nature, but there's also sort of an openness. You know, many systems do work uh, as integral wholes and open to new things. Now, if we look at our lives, our human lives, in terms of the encyclopedia of life, I think this is a sobering story. First of all, we do book of files. The encyclopedia has 30 volumes, and each volume has 450 pages. Each page is a million years. Volume 1 is the Big Bang. Now, volume 21 is the Earth. Volume 29 is the Cambrian period. Volume 30, the dinosaurs. Remember, here's the Jurassic Park, you know, the Brontosaurus and, you know, Heptosaurus. They go extinct on page 385. <laughs> volume 30, that's our volume. The mammals appear on page 390, you know, the whales and the elephants. Volume 30, page 450, the last line, and the last two words of that last line are human beings. That's us. <coughs> and guess what? There's no period. Because we are in evolution. And the more we can get our heads around that, we are part of a cosmic process of change and complexity we emerge out of that process, and we are in evolution. The three drivers of evolution that Teilhard spoke of are convergence. In other words, it doesn't take a scientist to realize that things come together. You know, hydrogen and oxygen came together, and they formed water. But water is neither hydrogen nor oxygen, is it? It's different. It's new. So convergence gives rise to complexity, new degrees of relationship, and with that complexity, emergence. New things emerge or evolve. What Taylor also noticed is that, and what he posited, is that as things come together and new, new more complex things form, consciousness rises. <laughs> and today, scientists are realizing more and more that mind is not just something humans have here. There's a mindfulness to nature itself. And therefore, mind is maybe in matter from the Big Bang onward. Now, what Teilhard said is that evolution is not background to the human story. It is our story. And therefore, we have to say we are not in evolution. We our evolution now on the level of self-consciousness. Now, just so, you know, to give a little brief scheme of these things, <laughs> these are basically our earliest cousins here on Earth, cyanobacteria. 
you might recognize some of their million <laughs> years ago. And here we are today. I mean, we have evolved, right, with our technology. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about technology tomorrow, from the big cell phone to your little computer in your hand. And we know that still half the population is still evolving. <laughs> <laughs> Pointed out. We are evolution now conscious of itself. In other words, with the human person, we can, in a sense, step apart and reflect on. We can know, you know, this universe that has, in a sense, given birth to us. That's an amazing thing. We know that we know. Yet, he says, we are also the arrow of evolution. Our choices make a difference not just to our immediate surroundings, it, they make a difference to the whole of evolution itself. Um, and that's where I think we need to begin to reframe the religious story. If we are evolution made conscious of itself, then we can't keep going around with an old God, you know, and an old religious story. And uh, Teilhard, at one point, he asked the question, who will give evolution its own God? And I read that and I said, well, I'll give it a try. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a picture of T.R. You know, a great visionary that you can see in the eyes here. You know, he's seeing something. He's seeing into the future. Now, one thing I want to point out, and why I think we've had such a difficult time reframing the religious story, is that you know that the classic Christian story has a classic philosophy to it. It's based on Aristotle. You know, it's Aristotle's philosophy. And, and Teilhard realized that. And he said, we can't keep with that. I mean, our, our whole understanding of being itself has radically changed with quantum physics and with, you know, uh, cosmology. What he noticed is that even if you look from the point of nature, there is a basic fundamental force of attraction. If you go from the Big Bang onward, things keep you know, being pulled to one another. Um, atom to atom, quark to quark, cell to cell, you know, compound to compound. So he looked at this force of attraction in nature. And he said, it's not just a random attraction. There seems to be a center to center attraction. And therefore, he began to speak of this attraction in terms of love. Now, this strikes our modern ear as a little bit funny because our culture has really, in a sense, reduced love to an emotion or sentiment. You know, we fall in in love and out of love. What Taylor does, he reclaims sort of the ancients' understanding of love as the deepest and the ultimate good of life. That goodness that is unitive, that's creative, that's generative of more being in life. So he speaks then of the physical structure of the universe as love. And therefore, he holds out for us a new philosophy of being itself, a philosophy based on love. And he's really one of very few people in the 20th century to really put forth the philosophy of love, but he never really developed it. The only other person that I know of is Max Scheller. Um, but love energy then allows us to look at this universe in a new way. First of all, it's very consonant with the New Testament. You know, God is love. But what Taylor is saying is this, this God love, divine love, he calls his principle omega. It's this absolute center of divinity at the heart of everything that exists from the Big Bang onward. Um, and of course, you know, love is not static. When love becomes static and stale, it loses its transformative power. Now, we know this from our human experience, right? And people are like, you know, you, you fall out of love. Uh, to fall out of love is to fall out of communication, to fall out of relationship. And what Taylor is saying is, when, when we talk about God's love, we're saying that God is the newest 
thing there is. The newest, the youngest thing there is. God is the beginning. And if we are united to God, we become new again. We tend to think, and we have thought that God is old, you know, sort of like old, up there type thing, just sort of a ho-hum God. And this kind of God has been sort of become old and stale. And what Terry is saying, no, this God is the dynamism of love itself, you know, at the heart of life itself. And therefore, just, you know, putting this in terms of the Christian story, he says, you know, if we ask the reason for Christ, I mean, our, our traditional Christian story says, oh, you know, well, there was sin. And because of a fall, you know, this is the week of Easter, right? Just saying, oh, happy fall, oh, happy fall. Felix Kulpa, if for if Adam had not sinned, Christ would not have come. Oh, yay to sin. Aren't we grateful? <laughs> <laughs> right? And we can made us very sin-centered, very self-focused, very worried, like, oh, you know, what am I going to do wrong? I'm not going to go to heaven, and God will only blah, blah, blah. <sighs> there I said, really? <laughs> there are many people in the tradition who said, really? You know, why build a Taj Mahal to cover a pothole? You know, why would God do something <laughs> as become incarnate because of a defect in creation. So they said from the beginning, and this is I think more scriptural, from the beginning, you know, Christ is the mystery hidden from the foundation, hidden from all eternity in the mind of God. God is love and God will to share love from all eternity. So Christ, you might say, is that symbol of what God intends from all eternity in this act of giving God's self to finite space-time in the act of creation. So we call this original love. I have often wondered, and I think we have you know, the opportunity now to build a new world and, and a new way of, of religious energy. You know, you know, get over the sin thing. Sin, yeah, yeah okay, it exists, we, we do mess up. Tara can say, why? It's an incomplete universe. It's an unfinished story. It's in the process of being created. It's not to minimalize sin. We do do bad things. You know, we do crummy things to one another in the earth. But what we are about fundamentally is about love. And he said Christ is first in God's intention to love and therefore God's intention to create. So he sees this story as, you might say, a unified story from the Big Bang on. I often think, you know, we have parceled out these things of creation and incarnation and redemption. That's because we can create more courses around them. <laughs> <laughs> but what Teilhard said is really, it's all one act of God. Creation, incarnation, and redemption are all dimensions of a single act of God's self-giving love. From the beginning, God made it empowering Big Bang life from the beginning, you know, and as God shares divine life with created life, incarnation happens. And as incarnation happens in this creation, things keep coming together. This law of love, this law of attraction. So there's redemption or reconciliation at the heart of cosmic life itself. He calls the whole process Christogenesis. In other words, it's a birthing of the Christ. So that Christ does not become this kind of, you know, superimposed uh, divine drama. Rather, the whole Big Bang evolution is deep incarnation. God, you might say, entering into biological life and the systems of nature. God not just becoming flesh, but becoming earth creature, becoming living being. So that the whole of this Big Bang story is, you might say, oriented to, biological cosmic life oriented toward, toward omega, toward unity, toward, you know, a oneness. So that Christ does not save us from the world, you know, the are you saved. Rather, Christ is the reason for the world. We exist for, you might say, that fullness of love. Maybe this is a better scheme here to show that um, the whole of Big Bang uh, cosmic evolution from the point of faith, Christian faith, is, for Teilhard, 
the birthing or the rising up of Jesus the Christ. So that um, this whole thing is moving towards greater complexity, unity, and wholeness. Which means that, uh, and I just want to point this out here, that Teilhard did not see Christianity as normative of religion. He saw Christianity as normative of evolution. In other words, this is not just a cosmic background radiation that we have. This is divine love, you might say, empowering this physical universe with human life consciously now acting in this universe towards, you might say, a goal, towards a fulfillment. And, you know, I think what, what Taylor points out is that Jesus, then, is not just a, just not a nice guy, you know, this really nice person from Nazareth came and did really good things. He, nor is Jesus, you know, I always point, I don't have to point this out to you because you're an enlightened group, but I think, you know, so many people, this is basically why I wrote the book, so many people, I think, have thought of Christ as Jesus is serving. You know, like, Jesus Christ, like he's right. the son of Mr. Right. and Mrs. Christ. <laughs> we have no, we have no consciousness that Jesus is the Christ. That's what we're saying here. That's right. The Christ, the Christos, if, you know, that's the Greek language. The Messiah, the Promised One, the Reign of God. You know, God's empowering love now breaking through this person in this way to move this evolution towards a new unity and love. Um, so when Jesus comes, you know, we're saying that this whole big bang evolution is Jesus in the making, so to speak. Uh, so that when Jesus emerges on the scene, he is, in a sense, a strange attractor. You know, he's, he's a faithful Jew doing some really strange new things. And people didn't get it, did they? We know the story, we just went through it. You know, and like, aren't you the son of like Joseph and Mary? You know, aren't you the carpenter's son? Yeah, I am. And he's saying, you know, what what the Jews were expecting, you know, this this promised Messiah, the reign of God is now. Something is breaking through in the now, this moment. So Jesus brings a new direction, a new creativity, uh, and I do think we can read the Gospels in light of evolution, the power of the new, the power of the now. And in Jesus, we see one who challenges any, anyone who wants to keep people outside community. He goes out and he brings them in. He is, in a sense, now, I usually ask the question, was Jesus Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what you kind of answer to to that. Someone said, oh, Jesus was Catholic, but his mother was Jewish. But, <laughs> you know, the word Catholic, Catholicos, means according to the whole. Yes. That's what it means. It does not mean Roman or the Pope or anything. It means Catholicos. And Catholicos, Catholicity, is a function of cosmology. That's how the Greeks conceived it. A sense of the whole for one who stands in relation to the whole. In Jesus, there is a new consciousness of the whole. He is a whole maker. And we know the stories how he heals and makes whole the leper. He forgives and makes whole the, you know, the repentant woman. He is compassionate and makes whole those who cannot find compassion elsewhere. And therefore, I think in Jesus, we see this new spirit of homemaking and spirit of wholeness. So salvation is not being rescued from salvation. is being made whole for a whole world, for a world that is seeking to become more whole. So I always say a healthy life for a healthy cosmos. But we know the story, too, that Jesus realized he couldn't say it wasn't about him as human it's about God. It's what God is doing, what Omega is doing in this evolution. So he says, unless I go, the spirit cannot come. His death, you might say, is that empowerment, you know, that release of the spirit 
towards wholeness. And in a sense, he, re he summarizes what evolution is about. Isolated individuals must let go for new, more complex unions to emerge. We hate to die to what we have known. You know, we want to hold on, hold on, hold on. What, what the death of Jesus symbolizes is evolution itself. You know, unless I go, the newness of this power of love cannot come forth and create something new in this world. So Jesus, you might say, and this is what we're celebrating this, you know, in this time. This new life into <coughs> Omega love. You know, this resurrection of Jesus speaks of a, a power, not just for our lives, but for the whole cosmos. Or as someone said, the invasion of the present <coughs> by the power of what is yet to come. Here's where I find, you know, Christians clear across the spectrum, too weak, too small. We, we live too small. If we really believe in resurrection, we believe in this risen Christ, we really should be the ones of not just the voice of liberation, the liberators. We need to be the evolvers, the whole makers. Um, you know, I always kind of quit, but, but I, I, again, in my own experience, we had a lovely, by the way, we had a lovely Easter celebration. I lived across the street from the Franciscan Monastery. And, but it's still, it's nice. You know, people are like, the Lord is risen. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs> We're saying death no longer has its power over us. The Lord is risen. Amen. Amen. I mean, seriously. So, um, here's where Teilhard, the visionary Jesuit, says Christian life is really about the next stage of evolution itself. He spoke of a new species, the Christified species. You know, church not as the institution of Rome, church as that phylum of the Christified ones gathered into a new community, empowering, evolving the whole into new life, seeing the world with new eyes, living from a new center of love. So this is Teilhard writing in the 30s and 40s. Christianity is a religion of evolution. And still, we, we, we are not yet there. You know, we're like, are you sure about that? <laughs> and um, what he's saying is that Jesus establishes the pattern, but out of the old is born the new. When I read the Gospels, and maybe this comes from, you know, working in this with, uh, evolution and this material, but it is all about me. New wine must be put, how many times do you read this? New wine into new wine skins. Let the dead bury the dead. I love that one, right? We're always like, can I just go turn back and bury the dead? No, he says, you want to stay, you want to bury the dead, you'll be dead. And just stay there. Jesus is about, you know, shaking the dust, moving forward. <laughs> Letting go, moving forward. Death, life. Death, life. That's, that's in a sense, the um, dynamic going on here. So what we find here is that God, this empowering Omega love, is completely chaotic. That's the great mystery, isn't it? We're pretty sure that God should come in at some point and do it for us. You know, clean up the world, you know, just tell us where to do and you know how to do things. <laughs> and you know, as one writer said, God is like a beggar at the soul's door. That's the type of God who is the God of Jesus. A God who gives it all away to be God for us. We are empowered, you might say, to do new things. If we want to, we have the choice. But I think one thing we need to do is to come to a new consciousness that we are in evolution, that demands our commitment to this process. 
uh, to realize that we are the arrow, which means we need a consciousness of being in evolution. How do we create a consciousness of being in evolution? I think that's the challenge for us in our time. How do we develop that awareness that we, A, we're moving, we are in process, that what we are about is um, new unions, new relationships, a deepening of love, a deepening of being. Before Tarot said, the Christian thought that we could attain God by abandoning everything, right? This kind of ascetic way. Now he says, we realize we can attain God only in and through the earth. So one of his famous lines is, I can be saved only in and through the universe and as a continuation of it. In other words, when we are made whole, we help make whole the universe that is in us and that we are in. Um, our lives do make a radical difference. I want to say this because we can talk about ecology. But unless we put ecology within the wider scope of cosmic evolution, we, in a sense, don't have a framework, a story, within which ecology can really flourish. Because ecology is not about human flourishing or biological flourishing. It's about cosmic flourishing. The whole cosmos is seeking to become whole. So, we are in a Christogenic universe. <coughs> Christ is still being born in this universe. But we are called, I think, to recognize that connectedness is our basic reality. You know, whether or not we want to be connected, that's a different story. At the heart of things, we are connected one to another. We are holes within holes. And nature, funny enough, nature works best according to wholeness. It works as little units of whole, local communities of wholes. We on the, on the human level, and I, and I think it's actually more modern than ancient, we have, formed, we have fallen into this tribalism, this compartmentalization. We are Newtonian through and through. I want my little space, I want my little house, do not bother me. If I want to talk to you, I will you know, email you or dial you up. And what we don't realize is that our actions affect the holes of which we are a part, and we are affected by all other holes. So, we need to de-engineer our thinking. We need to realize how mechanistically we are oriented, even in our treatment of one another. Um, and I think there are lessons from evolution. Learning how to live as a creature in evolution is, in a sense, to learn from nature itself. One is just accepting incompleteness. We hate incompleteness, right? We, we constantly, you know, we've got to, we've got to wrap it up. We've got to, you know, we've got to put a, a period to it. I think it's one of our challenges today. Can we learn to live in the now with the incomplete? It's good as it is. Can we then? Because I think what we do is we're so focused, we're, we're control freaks, okay? Because little Newtonians are control freaks, and we want to control everything. <laughs> But to let go and to live in the present moment is then to be able to recover the capacity of wonder and awe. I often wonder why Jesus said, you know, in the Gospels, to become like little children. Because little children have short attention spans, you know. But they live in the now, don't they? You know, they live in the present moment. They, they get angry and upset one minute, the next minute they're chasing butterflies around. You know, we humans, we get old, our little brains get divided, and we hold on. We grip for life, you know, and therefore we miss out on most of life. And I think we are asked to let go now, to let go and let flow into this <coughs> web of life that we are part of. And therefore, I think Teilhard would ask us to live in the primacy of love. 
Not love as a feel-good emotion. Love as the good that is in every person and in everything that exists. You know, and that love does mean compassion and forgiveness and reconciliation. So the systems uh, specialist Eric Yams once said, to live with an evolutionary spirit is to let go when the right time comes and to engage new structures of relationships. Do we know or can we discern when it, the right time has come to let go and to engage new structures of relationships? I think in our world today, a world that is deeply conflictual, deeply divided on so many levels, um, war and war, conflict, conflict, hatred, terror, fear. Never before, I think, has this power of love, you know, a call to return to the basic roots of what we really are by nature, been so profound. And maybe to realize that we are, in a sense, part of this Christogenic evolution, <laughs> that we are called in our lives, however we do so, to be homemakers, to gather life unto life, because it is our task now to help unify this whole in a personal center of love, because only in and through our lives can the absolute fullness of love arise. We are, in a sense, the birth givers of love. Thank you. Jesus the Christ 
is the personalizing um, divinity at the heart of cosmic evolution. So he's saying where, where, where there is, um, it, at least we can say for this universe, where there is the emergence of intelligent life, um, and I'm not even going to say carbon-based life, so we're going to talk about that tomorrow as we move into silicon-based life. Uh, but what he's saying is that where there in this universe, where we find this unyielding, we might say, force of attraction, uh, where we find this uh, pattern of evolutionary life that moves from simple to complex, and as far as we know, is irreversible. It has not gone back from complex to simple. Um, at least from our observable, or even um, from what science is telling us. He's saying that it is not something in evolution. It's not just an evolutionary background. It is someone. That the whole of cosmic evolution is, so what he's saying here is that Jesus Christ is not a figure. So Jesus Christ is the whole. The Christ is the whole. And that's hard for us, truthfully, to get our minds around because we are brought up confining the Christ to Jesus alone. And using Pontypridd's language uh, in terribly Greek, Jesus is the Christ, but Christ is more than Jesus. Mm. So we're saying that the whole universe is a cosmic personalizing universe. Would that be in other universes? Uh, I, you know, I, it could be, it could be, that's totally speculative, isn't it? Because all we know is this universe. So um, I think if we could just at least get our attention on this universe and you know work towards a type of evolutionary Christology, we might come to a, a wider sense first of our interconnectivity. We don't have that. We really don't. Uh, we think we're very tribal in our thinking. Uh, we are very personal, very compartmentalized, whether it's language or culture or ethnicity or race or whatever it is. So how can we even make that first step to get to an evolutionary consciousness that is based on the interconnectivity of cosmic life to help move us then towards a reframing of what it means to live gospel life in a universe that's moving. Yes? I wonder, um, I think you are very convincing about the centrality of love. The problem though is that Rather than the power of love, for many of us and for our world, more important is to love power. Yes. <laughs> and um, so that the whole matter of transforming human life in the direction of love, rather than in the love of right. power. Um, but I, my, I have a, the question is, is this, um, you make me think of the words, pantheism and panentheism. Right. And in one sense, uh, I'm beginning to become, with the wholeness and interconnectedness, I'm becoming a pantheist. Yeah, I that's great, thought. actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, first of all, uh, if any religion is going to become pantheist, I think Christianity comes close. Uh, for one thing, we're positive that God becomes one of us, seriously. Think about that, you know? So, but we haven't lived as even panentheists. We have lived as comfortable dualists. You know, we're, we're saying God becomes, you know, human. God becomes truly one of us. God takes on earth and really? Well, if you're gonna say that, you know, then you're saying divinity. I mean, we're saying that secularity is imbued with sacredness. We're saying that materiality is imbued with divinity. That comes close to pantheism. So the term that Teilhard uses is, is Christian pantheism. Yeah. And what he said is, we are too, too, we're so Greek in our thinking. We're, so, we're still Neoplatonic dualists. You know, he's saying Christian pantheism must be dynamized, universal. He uses this language. You know, I say yay to Christian pantheism. You know, a little divinity can go a long way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of the dualism. It yeah. has done nothing. You want to know why we love power? Because we are dualists with preserving our own little autonomous mm -hmm. space. Yeah. We do not see ourselves as interconnected in a, in, a, in a whole much larger than ourselves. 
So I say let, let go of that old Neoplatonic dualistic and be, let's give a charge for Christian pantheism. I don't know if recall it's ever even in the I think it's dead around like you know, in the 2000. Um, Brian Schwinn? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Father Thomas Berry? Yes. Got together and co-wrote a, a book on the new. Um, yes. New the story. New, yeah. new uh, creation story. And when I was told, I was up part of your university and they gave them awards and prizes for this and everything. And I thought from that, what was set up there, that of course the way you can learn is start with these books with the other children in school. Yeah. Or or, or right. start with the universities yes, and it's going right. come down and it'll be books and mm -hmm. the energy will be another chapter in the besides the nervous system, circulatory, yes. energy system. Mm -hmm. So where are we? I mean a lot of this these thoughts were supposed to be generated in that new creation story. So where are we with that? I mean, so right. So let me just say this, right. Right, so let's let's begin, you know, from you know two years old up type thing. There are people beginning to write children's books, you know, along these lines. I mean, some people giving books periodically, and so someone gave me three books on the new Big Bang Cosmos story for children, and it's wonderful. It's illustrated, and yeah. Let me just say this, you know, because here's what I think. I think. We think, oh, Christianity has been around 2,000 years, you know, we're at the end of it. We are in a 13.8 billion year old universe. <laughs> Christianity was born around 11 a.m. this morning. We're just beginning. I, I want to say that the first 2,000 years may have just been a prelude yeah. to, you might say, beginning of Christianity as we move forward into the future. So I, you know, I'd say for all you creative people, you know, get your get your pens out, get your breaststrokes out, start writing children's books, do creative things. We need new language, we need new prayers, we need new artwork. I can't tell you how much the artwork and songs that we've been singing for so many years have wired us, you know, to think in dual terms, you know, heaven, earth, you know, uh, these kind of matter spirit, God, good, bad. We need new evolution, we need new language, new ways of patterning our consciousness for being in evolution as people committed to a mega love to us. Yes? How do you see Trinity? Between cosmology 
and spirituality. If you go to the Native American Museum in the Smithsonian, in Washington, D.C., it's fantastic. <coughs> there. They have all the different Native American cosmologies, and the cosmologies govern the life of the community. And in the sense that that is what we're seeing here. Now, one of the differences may be this. Um, the Native American cosmology has a cyclical nature to it. In other words, it's a, birth, a rising, a dying type of, 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 of pattern. This, uh, the Christian story, Christianity, and when we talk about it in history, we're saying that there's a movement. It's not cyclical. It's, in a sense, linear, in the sense that it's moving towards something. So it doesn't return. In other words, it, you know, it doesn't kind of rise and die over thousands of years. There is rather this, what we might say, progression or movement toward um, something before us. So the, one of the differences from Native American spirituality is we talk about Christianity as the power of the future. This is Teilhard's language. God is the power of the future. And that future is what keeps pulling us forward into, into new, something new. Um, so there is resonances, but there's some differences. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry, building on that question that I was just thinking as well, is you, know, you were speaking about that and moving towards and, and, and then the cyclical um, cosmologies. But what about the original spirals? I mean, you know how you see it all yes, in the spiral? Right. And so I'm wondering, could it be a fusion of the two? Uh, absolutely. Could it be that that cyclical was more like a spiral moving towards something? Yeah, that's something? a good point. You know, the Greeks had something of that idea, uh, but they likened it sort of like to the Christmas tree. Yeah. So the spiral, in a sense, has a larger base. But as you're moving toward omega, you know, even in our own spiritual life, yeah, the, you know, the, the, um, the spiraling becomes shorter and shorter. So that eventually future and present merge, I think they call it eternal life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Bar well, Barbara Marks Hubbard uses an image in her uh, courses, um, her Agents of Conscious Evolution course. Yes using that, that evolutionary spiral, yeah, that, that, that is right. exactly yeah. what you're mm -hmm. describing. And uh, so that fits into you know, the, the traditions of uh, indigenous cultures. Uh, yeah. and, and I'm thinking also about um, the prophecies of uh, this time, this particular time of no time, um, the Mayan calendar ended because they could not see what humanity what course humanity would take at this time. And then there's also that, that meshes with the story of the, the second coming. Yeah, that's And amazing. so could that be, I mean, some people say that, you know, Christ is coming, Christ is coming back. Yeah. But I see it as Christ, the, the Christ consciousness emerging in humans. That's right. That will enable us to, that's to right. uh, return to wholeness <laughs> yes. and be able to move forward. Right, I think Barbara speaks, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so Terra holds it. In fact, Barbara Marks Hubbard, I think, follows Terra this. Right. So it is the emergence of Christian consciousness. So that, that there is no, you know, second coming of Christ in the sense like Jesus is going to come down from heaven on the cloud and, you know, the angels. I mean, we always have these images. It is rather that Christ emerges from within as we, in a sense, as we <coughs> rise in consciousness and being in that Christic one. Christ is then... Christ becomes our lives. I mean, that's the second coming of Christ is the coming of Christ within us and within the whole of the cosmos. And I just I, I want to bring into the image of the double helix, the DNA strands, and how that that imagery is is um, mm -hmm. expressed in the human body, mm -hmm. and how you know we are we are universes. Yes. Embodied. Oh, right. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Sure. So, what are your thoughts on? how long it is before human beings become extinct, and what are your thoughts on characteristics of the creatures that will come after us? Right. So, that's a good question. I want to say stay tuned for tomorrow, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's the thing. I believe we can... Oh, let me say, there's several things I want to say. We can, we can on one level, annihilate ourselves. We do have that power, by the way. You know, we can blow ourselves up with nuclear power, we can self-destruct ecologically. On that level, you know, I want to say this. We may destroy our, you know, most of our species, but omega is at the heart of life. And life, natural life, is very resilient. Yeah. We, we may destroy our species, but life, cosmic life, 
will not be extinguished. That's one thing I want to say. On the other hand, I am very, one of my interests uh, is technology. So I've been working a lot in transhumanism, and um, so I could talk a little bit more about this. We are already a new species, quite honestly. We, we are on the verge of leaving Homo sapiens. Um, if I look at, certainly, younger generations, everyone's a cyborg. You know, yeah. And we are on our way to becoming techno sapiens or cyber sapiens. And it's really a, a, because we have been unconscious about the rapid influx and the seamless um, interwovenness of technology into Homo sapien life. You know, it has happened so quickly that we don't even realize yeah. that we are no longer the persons we were even 50 years ago. So we don't have to worry about becoming something new. We already have become something new. The question is, what is it that we want? You know, what are we becoming? And, and you know, where are we going with our technologies? That, to me, is the next cosmic question in evolution. And it's a religious question as well. But like I said, <coughs> stay tuned for tomorrow. I'll have another um, hour to talk about that. Yes? It seems to me that um, this world view of um, evolution process is very optimistic and hopeful. Like, could you say um, how human suffering, singularity of one suffering, understood in this um, right. evolutionary view of the world? And then, yeah. Yeah. That, you know, that's a common criticism of they are. You seem like this happy-go-lucky, naive um, evolutionary biologist. He, let me just say several things. One, from the point of natural sciences, evolution is not so pretty. Uh, there is a costliness to the emergence of new life. If you think we got here, you know, on a happy-go-lucky day, you're, it's wrong. Our human life, is here because of the costliness of many species that went extinct, you know, to make this life possible. Um, there has been violence within the cosmic evolution itself. I mean, we're talking asteroids and supernovas and all sorts of cosmic events. But what we do know is that we're here. And what we can say is um, while there is violence, in nature, there is suffering in nature, there is an irrepressible power of unity that does prevail despite the seemingly, you know, uh, the travail of nature itself. And it keeps it life, not human life, just life, presses onward towards more unity and life. That is sort of, I mean, if you look from the Big Bang, you know, through simple cellular life into more complex life, into homo sapien life, into our life, there is something that keeps pressing on. Now, that in no way justifies suffering. In no way does it say, well, then, you know, just go ahead. We do make choices, don't we? We, we make choices, and, and I think, quite honestly, I put it another way, we have become the most unnatural species in this cosmos. The humans are the most unnatural because we are the only ones who kill our own, I think, other than rodents, I think that's the only other species. 